Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to present the, the opportunity to present this work. Thank you for coming. I work at Roche Pharmaceuticals, as we said here. I work in the chemoinformatics department. So our job as chemoinformaticians is to support the high throughput screening groups. What we do is we screen these huge collections of compounds, and I'm talking about 2.4 million compounds, in the search of compounds that are active or also safe. So the way we do this, and the way we have been doing this for the last 20 years, is by chemical similarity. So we start with a compound that we know is active, a compound of reference. We might find this in another experiment, in the literature. We might take as inspiration a drug from another company. And we search for analogs, compounds that are structurally similar to our reference compounds in the hope that structural similarity also means activity. So what we do is we use a chemical fingerprint as this. An example is the ECFP fingerprint. A fingerprint is a vector of the most common chemical fragments. So if our compound of reference has one of these fragments, we put a one in the vector, otherwise it's a zero. In that way, every compound in our collection is associated to its unique chemical identifier. So finding analogs to my compound of reference is as easy as comparing, for example, using a Tanimoto difference, my unique identifiers to the compound of reference. We can do that very fast, very efficient. We've been doing it. It works. So it turns out that I come with a set of 10,000 analogs to my chemist. They put them in their experiment, and they say it works. 10% of my compounds are active. Now, we did not learn anything. Your compounds, the compounds that you gave us, just look exactly the same as the compound we gave you to look for analogs. Of course, by construction, I use chemical similarity. The problem is that if I have problems with my compound, for example, liabilities such as patent space or toxicity, the compounds that I produce and give them to the chemist to test are very likely to inherit the same liabilities. Also, and more importantly, structural similarity does not necessarily mean activity. In our collections, we might have a lot of compounds that are also active and are not structurally similar. So, what we want is variety. As pharma, we want to diversify the risk. So, we, an example I show here, these are all active compounds for COX-2, like my reference compound, but they all look structurally different. That's what we want. So how do we train our models to find these compounds? So first of all, we should step back for a little bit and think, what makes a compound a hit? And that's an interesting question. We could also ask ourselves, what do all these active compounds have in common, for example? So one thing that all these compounds may have in common is the pocket. So for years, we have been developing pharmacophore models to train, to train a model to bind, for compounds to bind this pocket. And we do that all the time. And the compounds that we find, sometimes they are not structurally related. However, we might incur a problem like this, a protein that has more than one pocket. So if we train our models for one pocket, we will also lose generality because we will miss a lot of other compounds that are binding the other pocket. So we might say, well, all these compounds may have in common that they all bind to the same target. That's right too. But then we lose generality too because we have a target directly upstream or immediately downstream our target of interest that also modulate our target. So what we really care about is to look for compounds that produce the same phenotype. We want to cure a disease. We want to kill bacteria. That's what we care about. We don't care about the target itself. So how do we find these compounds? What we care about, again, is to find a model that will capture the pathway interactions. So at this point, we come to realize that chemical structure is not enough, and it will never be enough to find these compounds. So what we really should be doing now is to incorporate other sources of data, for example, binding data, pathway data, bioactivity data, just like HTS data. So we should be integrating this data together 
to make new predictions. So the way we propose is following the work of other people before us, by Cover and his co-workers, for example, in 95, which is using biospectra. What we mean by biospectra is to use a fingerprint as well, but this fingerprint is not binary. This fingerprint, in each element of the fingerprint, we have the outcome of an experiment. This is what happens if we put this compound in this assay, in a kinase assay, or GPCR assay, or a protease assay, and I'm not putting the specific name of the target because I cannot, for obvious reasons, but we, this belongs to a specific assay. And we've been screening a lot. We've been screening for about 15 years now at Roche. So we have a lot of these assays. We should be using this data. Now, as you can see, and I'm sure people are going to ask about it, and I'm not going to deny, the problem of this approach is the sparsity of this matrix. Figure out this matrix in your mind. We have 2.4 million compounds. We have 300 assays. But some compounds have been synthesized yesterday, the day before. So we don't have data for those compounds in all our assays. Our matrix is very sparse, and I'm going to show you how we try to overcome that limitation in the next slides. So, as I was saying before, we are integrating data for, from all kinds of technologies. From HTS, we use fluorescence, we use luminescence, uh, absorbance, we cover a whole range of different targets. We have uh, kinases, GPCRs, PPIs. We know that pharma has a lot of screening for certain targets, so we have some biases. We're not going to deny that. But one thing is very important. Oh, more than half of our assays are in vitro assays. They are target specific. However, we have a lot of cell-based assays where we do not know the target. And those are very important because those are going to give, give us the pathway interactions that we were looking for. So now that we have a fingerprint, we have to define a new metric to compare two compounds. And we are going to use what we call biological similarity. So two compounds are biologically similar where, when their fingerprints are similar. So we tested different metrics, and we found that the most efficient, more quickly and reliable is Pearson correlation. But in addition, we are going to use a weight that relates to the overlap of the fingerprints. And the overlap are the amount of assays in which these two compounds have been tested together. So from now on, biologically similar compounds do not only have their vectors correlated, but we also have enough information to assure that they are similar. So with that, we need to test our uh, method against the other method that I mentioned before, chemical similarity. So we are going to do a lot of recalls, and we are going to measure our recalls in two things. In the amount of compounds, active compounds that we can fish using probes that are active from a pool of actives and inactives, that's one. And we are also going to be interested in the amount of new scaffolds that we, we will retrieve using our method. And we're going to test it in 26 targets. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you the compound record. And I'm going to compare our method, HTS fingerprints, with, against the chemical structure fingerprints. And I'm going to show the average rock scores that we obtain for each target family, for each target in colors. So these are rock scores that go from 0 0.5, which is random, to one absolutely perfect performance. And we can see that most of our targets are below the unity line, and that's not good. That means our method gives less active compounds than, chemical, uh, uh, than the chemical fingerprints. However, we are not going to be disappointed. I'm, it gets better in the next slide. If I compare the amount of new scaffolds I recover with my method, now, yes, we are even with the other method. But there are scaffolds and scaffolds. All scaffolds were not created equal, and scaffolds that are different can also look similarly uh, so it can look similar. I will, this will become more clear in the next slide. I'm going to go into a specific target, which is the ABCB1 transporter, or the efflux pump. This target is very important for drug resistance. So I present to the methods my probe, which is a potent, a kind of a potent compound. And if I use chemical fingerprints, I retrieve a compound that is similar to my probe. But of course, I, my construction has to be similar. However, with HTS fingerprints, we can retrieve compounds that have no overlap, chemical overlap, with our probe, because we don't, did not use 
chemical similarity at all. For another example is this natural product. This natural product, the potylon, is very potent uh, in ABCB1. And if we use chemical fingerprints in our collection, we retrieve nothing. Its chemical features are very complicated and hard, and there might not be compounds like this. However, if we use HTS fingerprints, we can retrieve another natural product that has the same biologically similar properties, and we also can get other compounds that are more interested to us, interesting to us because they look more like drugs. These compounds are easy, easier to synthesize and maybe have better physical chemical properties. So in picture this, we start with the natural products, which has been optimized by nature to go into the cells, into the membranes and binds, and we can move on to a compound that we have made that maybe has the same biological similar, uh, properties and could potentially be a drug candidate. So I'm going to show another example, PD4C a target that has to do with uh, inflammation, and we use a reference compound that is rolipram and anti-inflammatory. And again, if I use chemical fingerprints, I obtain a lot of scaffolds, but my scaffolds have a lot of overlap with my, with my reference compound, as expected. Now, if I use HTS fingerprints, I'm able to do what we call scaffold hopping. That means to go from one scaffold to, that is active, to another scaffold, very dissimilar, which is also active. And we can see almost, except for here, no chemical overlap with our mo uh, first molecule. So now we learn that our fingerprints work. They might not give us as many compounds as the initial molecule, but they give us compounds that are different, and that's what we care about. Now, now that we have a fingerprint, we can actually use any application that involves machine learning, for example, clustering. So I went ahead and clustered cluster the Novartis collection. And what I obtained are clusters or bio of biologically similar compounds. So what does it mean to belong to a biologically similar cluster? What it means, sorry, before I explain, we can see here some examples of the clusters. The rows are the compounds and the columns are the assays, and we see that there are different, different patterns. So these clusters, if we look more in depth, and I cannot show you all the molecules, I'm going to just show some examples of molecules that are publicly available. This is one cluster, and th what we find is the compounds in those clusters are not necessarily structurally related. They might not even bind to the same targets, but they all enrich for shared go terms, such as functions or processes. For example, all these compounds modulate in some way the GPCR signaling pathway. Or these compounds, they all bind to different tyrosine phosphate phosphatases, but sometimes they have similar structure and sometimes not. So imagine the opportunities that we can use this for if we think about drug repurposing or polypharmacology. So we can start with a compound in one cluster and bring other compounds to the chemist to test, or we can start with a pathway that we are interested in and find a bunch of compounds in our clustering that we can provide the chemist and I can come up with a hypothesis for new compounds. Or for example, I can have compounds that, have, that come from a phenotypic screen that people have no idea which target is working. And I can go and see to which cluster these compounds belong and bring a target identification hypothesis. And that is something that is very relevant. So now that is said, I'm going to change gears because I'm running out of time for uh, to a slightly different topic. So we have already defined a metric for biosimilarity with using the HTS fingerprints. Because of this, it's very easy for us to define the concept of biodiversity using the same HTS fingerprints. Biodiverse compounds are compounds that do not share similar pathways or they do not modulate similar targets. Biodiverse compounds are, for example, the cluster centers of the bioclusters I mentioned before. Biodiversity it's very important for pharma, and I will show you in the next slide how can we make use of biodiversity to find new compounds. As I've said before, pharma has this huge, big pharma, has these huge uh, collections of compounds, and compounds usually come stored in plates. So the uh, screening processes or pro uh, workflow are fully automated by robots that take these plates and test them on an experiment. Sometimes, 
even these processes and workflows are very optimized and they go very fast and they are sometimes cheap, we cannot screen the whole collections because the collections grow so big because of political reasons, because we're bringing a new target where the director of the project says, no, that's too much, that's too much time. So what we typically use is a reduced version of our, of our library that captures the properties of our whole collection. That is, we use diversity, we use a non-redundant non plate. So how, what does it mean diversity? So we typically use chemical diversity. We take representatives of chemical space that in the hope that we are covering chemical space. But one thing that we learned that is very surprising 50% of the chemical, of all the compounds of corporate collections are dead. And believe me, I, test, I look at the data, Roche and Novartis have this. And this is, was very interesting to find at first. These are compounds that have never been reported active in any assay. Should we screen these compounds? So somebody may say, yes, we should screen them all. Yes, but suppose you don't have money to screen them all. Which ones do you choose? The problem is that they might be active in, a comp in, in some assay in the future, but they might be never active, because maybe nature is not that creative when it designs compounds. Compounds have to go through the cell, and so maybe compounds that go through the cell only cover some specific parts of chemical space, so why to explore all? And even more, suppose that we choose the wrong compounds from this half as representatives, we are going to miss a lot of regions of chemical space. And that is very, uh, is very bad. So what we offer, another alternative, what, we, what we've seen, is we chose compounds based on biodiversity. We chose compounds that cover the proteome, that modulate different targets. And that is good for two reasons. First, we assure coverage if we have a new target that comes in the pipeline. And also, we ensure activity. All the compounds that we put in our, in our place are going to be biologically relevant. We've observed something that Kaiser and other people also observed. If a compound is active, it tends to be active again and again. And we should be using that feature. So what we have observed in this work that I did at Novartis, with Anne May Wasserman, uh, we, observe, uh, we observed, we looked at the efficiency of these plates, how efficiency of a plate correlates with scaffolds or with genes. And we, we found that chemical diversity of these plates is not correlated with the efficiency of the plate in, the, in, being, in having actives, with the efficiency of the plate, the heat rate. However, biodiversity correlates much better with how the plate performs in a screen. So the take home message is that yes, we should be integ integrating all this data that we already have in virtual screens. And that might be sound obvious, but it's very hard to for me to conven convince the chemist that to pay attention to the biologist. The second, I, we now learn that bioactivity offers a new way to look, to navigate space. And now it's not chemical space anymore, it's chemical biology space. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I would like to thank my boss, Daniel Stoffler, which believes in this project and brought me to Roche. I would like to also uh, uh, acknowledge my former co-workers and my boss, my postdoc boss, uh, uh, Novartis, Mayer, and Jeremy, and Anne is presenting a poster B20. I want to give a special thank you to my family, Lorenzo. Maya is my friend, she's babysitting my, my baby. And Lorenzo for coming all the way here in our maternity leave uh, for this presentation. Thank you. I take any question. Hi. A uh, very interesting uh, observation of the limitation of 2D fingerprints. I was wondering if you have any experience with this method to compare the shape or the 3D structures of molecules and whether it works. Uh, as a way of, of doing scaffold hopping? No, so pharmacophore uh, models do scaffold hopping. In addition, 2D methods also do scaffold hopping, and we did that, those tests, and you see some scaffold hopping. But the way they do the scaffold hopping is when you present many compounds as probes, where the compounds are all different. So the new compounds that come in are different to the, to the beginning because maybe they are linear combination 
or, or some kind of combination. So pharmacophore and, three, and uh, ECFP, for example, provide scaffold hopping, and that's well documented. If you look at our references, you'll find how we discuss this, but uh, they do scaffold hopping. But I think we do it by construction, because we don't rely on chemical structure at all. Hi, thank you. Really nice talk. Um, you. Could you comment on the, whether or not you've explored the utility for this in not just um, new indication space, but also in safety or toxicology space, and if, you ha if, if, you, if it actually holds up in those, because they're biological processes. It's perfect. It's yes. Defined. So people have used uh, some indication, the uh, fingerprints, they, it's done, but uh, not in a, in a large scale like this. I think we have the data on we, that, that's perfect uh, idea for next steps, yes. Okay. So I wondered if you found any general principles for um, distinguishing between these dead compounds and these active compounds. So is there anything that would say, for me, I'd throw these away anyway because based on these rules that I've learned in that, in that way? Yes. Even if I found that, uh, nobody will want to throw them away because if they become active in some time, some like a worker remarked the other day, if they become active for another company, then we lose our jobs. But uh, uh, training, models, training, training models to see what these compounds mean, for example, I would imagine Bayesian model for compounds that worked and compounds that work, we have not done that, and I think it's what we should be doing next. Hi, Greta Walk. And um, one question. I mean, at the end, you would like to be predictive in the human being. And for these bioactive compounds, I guess in the company, you have many data on the pharmacokinetic and the pharmacodynamics. Have you tried to combine also this data in your selection criteria, or can you make any comment on this one? Yes. So people use sometimes physical chemical uh, fingerprints. So one idea would be finger, physical chemical. Uh, so you mean toxicity or you mean any no, property? Pharmacokinam phar pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics in clinical studies. I think it would be interested to try it in, in the fingerprint. So once we started with this fingerprint, we, we saw how powerful it was. And, and we can all imagine how many ways we can use this and we, how many variables we can put, especially pharmacokinetic uh, properties. I think the only caveat that I see in that is we might not have that data for all the compounds, but hey, we have, the, we, we, we have those problems here too. So it would be interesting to see how much of that data we have, and then we include more columns or a separate fingerprint. Thank you. Uh, Itamar Boruko from CompuGen. If you have a new compound that is known nothing, how many assays, and do you know which assays should you perform in order to bring an ample number of uh, alternatives? Okay. Um, no, we can't use it. <laughs> so if we have a new compound just like that, it doesn't respond to this method. We, we should use, for example, similarity to compounds that we have to try to infer it's, a, it's chemical. The problem is new compounds can only participate in future assays. So this, is for, this for us is for free because this is all data that has been accumulated for 20 years. Okay, but I mean, in principle you could run some assays on this compound and then how many com assays will you need in order to... So what you're asking me is how uh, in independent these columns are. Is that your question? Because that's a different question. Because, so if, I br if you bring me a, another compound, what I would do first is like, let's see if we have something like this in the collection, and I would assign the similar fingerprints, run a couple of tests to see if it also binds the same targets. But in principle, the method, it, that's out of the scope of this method. If we can use that method, if I have to, I will do it. I will do whatever it takes. But, uh, but in principle, a new compound has no fingerprint. Okay. So we could imagine, then I, for future work, but we could imagine the future thinking how can we train models to reproduce this fingerprint for a new compound. If you have to redesign the high throughput uh, section of the company, which essays, essays will you select for this? How many essays will you select and which essays will you select for for okay. to be useful for this method? I put everything that I have. You work in a too big company. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, 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 a big question for me, it's uh, just the personal, no? how we can do this uh, with PubMed, because I think there are a lot of opportunities in the public databases to do this. Uh, Igor, 
be a good idea to combine the, vi the virtual screening with, with your biodiversity, let's say, uh, that maybe first we can try the biodiversity approach and get some uh, compounds uh, for yes. uh, an illness, uh, yes. to, to treat an illness, and then to use them for a virtual screening would be better. Exactly. So what we show in our paper is, a, a, I didn't go into the, the, but the protocol is the following. We make a reduced libraries with compounds that are very diverse. And then, when we have the hits, we expand, we use, we call it expanding. So we do a first screen with the reduced library, and then we do cherry picking. So, we, so what we do is we expand our compounds using chemical similarity to all the rest. And we have a robot that does cherry picking. So it brings compounds that we tell them, and we do another screen. A second round of screen. So we combine two methods. First, the, the HTS fingerprint that gives variety, and then another one that gives amount. Okay. And, then, and then we, of course, opt optimize on the leads. So it would be also a good idea if you do a virtual screening in a certain pharmacophore, first to, to, to search for biodiversity of, of, let's say, this is a protein in a kind of illness and a specific illness. So to find for biodiversity for this illness and then just try these compounds in this virtual screening in only one pharmacopoeia. Ah, you mean putting them back with virtual screening in the, in the, in the, the with machine? Do like a pharma, like docking? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah but that's but the to, to do before biodiversity approach better. I mean, I was thinking. Yes, it's, yes. It could be. We can totally do that, but uh, I don't know if this is the best way because what we will get is things maybe that hit a target upstream or downstream or another pocket. Mm, yeah. In that case, if it was the same pocket, yes, we can see, but I think there are faster and more efficient methods to do that without this. 